One wrong move and you go off the cliff. And when you're on a road like this, look here, you can literally feel your heart sink because over here, you can see a marker, a grave marker for seven people who died here falling off the cliff. Seven people here, four here and here, a total of 12 people all at once. Even if you've got a very experienced driver, you can't help but see these things. This marker was put up here four years ago, this one two years ago, and this one is new. It's not a road, it's a direction. Full U-turns following one another, forming hairpin road bends all the way. And the tougher spots are where the road becomes really narrow. And it even feels like it has a slight slant towards the outer edge. And it becomes really crazy when you get two vehicles and some shepherds bump into one another on a narrow segment of the road. No one fell off? Or one did. A cow fell off the cliff, for real? Two cows fell off? Oh my! It's a long and winding road that goes on through the mountains and ravines for dozens of miles. This is Lyadov, and today we are in the mountains of Georgia, taking up the road that counts among the top 10 most dangerous in the world. Our goal is to get to the mostly remotely located village up in the mountains, close to the border between Georgia and Russia. This is Lyadov, reporting on how people live in Georgia. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet? The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right, go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. People, can you guess what road is considered the most dangerous in the world? The BBC Travel made its own list of the most dangerous roads to travel on our planet. This list includes Russia's Kolyma Highway and Bolivia's Death Road built by POWs from Paraguay. But then, in 2014, a BBC crew came to Georgia and attempted to drive this road in Tusheti. Our goal today is to take this very road to the very ends and see how people live on the other end of it. Well, my friends, it's 6 a.m. and truth be told, I have been up most of the night. You know, well, maybe you know, when it's the night before something important you need to do, like taking a test or something of that kind, like crossing a border, and you get these jitters. <laughs> That's what I'm having right now. If we were to drive there without any stops, without shooting anything on the way, it would take us five to eight hours. Well, that's the real estimate, from five to eight hours. Either five or almost twice as many. And since we need to make stops for shooting, including getting aerial views with the drone and so on, my guess, we'll be driving for a total of 12 to 15 hours. And the last thing I really want is for us to get stuck by midnight somewhere in the middle of the road in the mountains. Yet, as much as I hate it, it's quite likely to happen. 
It's a cloudy morning and a 30-minute drive ahead of us to the point where the mountain road begins. The safest way to go is in a Mitsubishi Delica. I've never seen this Mitsubishi van before, but it turns out to be the most popular vehicle in Tusheti. It's not wide and very steady on U-turns, although when you put cargo on top, it becomes quite tall. We are taking some spare parts for a gas truck to help out some guy who got stuck on the road up in the mountains about three days ago. So our trunk is full and we have to put stuff on top. I really hope it won't cause our van to tip over as we go. Our first stop is to get fuel. You can see the idea is that if we were hypothetically going to spend a night in the mountains, because when the sun sets you can't drive, it's pitch dark, it's just impossible, so you have to wait until the dawn. So that in case we'd need to keep the engine running because it gets very cold up in the mountains at night, like proper wintertime cold, so at the very least we need to have some extra fuel for the van and hope for the best. You can't just get any driver to take you there. This kind of trip calls for someone very experienced, who's already driven this road and knows all the narrow spots on it. Our driver's name is Gocha. He was one of those very few people who agreed to go. And I can tell you that Gocha is an amazing driver and a cool guy. He's been taking people up and down this road for 10 years now. Although a lot depends on weather conditions. Well, this road is one of the top 10 most dangerous in the world. Uh, and what makes it so dangerous? What, what kind of risks are there? It's not a road, it's a direction. We began our voyage in the city of Tel Aviv, and our final destination is Tusheti's de facto capital, the village of Omalok, located up in the mountains. This is a bird's eye view of the road. Just look at it. This here is one of its most dangerous segments, with over 50 hairpin turns concentrated within a four-mile stretch. After about 10 minutes of driving on the asphalt road, we hit gravel. The road barrier doesn't last much longer. It's only there at the very beginning. After that, the road becomes a direction, as Gotcha said. There are places where the road crosses mountain rivers. They can fill up really fast and literally wash a car off the road into the abyss. Sometimes rocks and landmasses obstruct the river flow and make the river overflow, forming a huge pond. It's all extremely scary and at the same time, insanely beautiful. Staying focused is the key. Gotcha keeps focused on the road only. One slight move can literally send our van into a deadly fall. There are parts of the road where gravel is so loose it can start sliding off the cliff under the weight of the vehicle, and that's at the altitude of several thousand feet. When you're here, you get very mixed feelings because you can't help but see how insanely beautiful this land is. Look at this fountain. Uh, sorry, I mean waterfall. <laughs> My head must be a bit dizzy because of the rarefied air, and you have to be extremely careful about where you step here. As you can see, I'm walking very slowly with a lot of care. I'm almost on my tiptoes, because one wrong step can be my last one. And when you're on a road like this, look here, you can literally feel your heart sink. Because over here you can see a marker, a grave marker, for seven people who died here falling off the cliff. They even have a picture of the Kamaz truck they were riding. All seven have one death date, July 27th, 2019. Six men and a 13-year-old boy. The driver lost control of the truck while making a turn, and they all fell off the cliff. The truck that weighs seven tons fell a thousand feet into a narrow gorge. The impact was so huge, the truck got smashed almost flat. It's a horrifying sight. Look. They even put a piece of that truck by the marker. It's all covered with rust. And it gives me such a creepy feeling that I don't want to touch it. Because, you know, we've still got about a five-hour drive ahead of us. And at the risk of appearing superstitious, I'd rather not. So, the landscape is divinely beautiful. But your heart sinks here, to be honest. Just a couple of months after that tragedy, a cyclist from Germany fell off the road at the same turn and died. His friends tried to rescue him and climbed down, 
but they were unable to climb back up. People had to send for a rescue team, and yet this road attracts tourists from all over the world. And I can perfectly understand them. Just look at these views. It's a special kind of pleasure to sit by a mountain stream, which is absolutely clean. And you can just scoop it up with your hands. It's ice cold. The water is ice cold. Damn, amazing. And you can drink it. God, it tastes so good. It's unbelievable. It tastes like, you know, if you had a lot of snow and it just started to melt and you're drinking it and you can even feel all those bits of snow in it. Like, you could almost taste snowflakes that have melted. This stream water is literally coming from the snow on mountain tops that's literally just melted. And of course, the overall feeling here, I don't even know how to describe it. When you're sitting by a stream in the mountains and you wash your face with this water and you drink it, it's out of this world. And if you want to experience it here, there's only a very short span of time you can do it, in fact. Today is October 7th. And just a week from now, they will close this road down because that's when it starts snowing and the snow will ruin the road. They close the road for nine months. And during winter, there is no road because it's fully buried under the snow. Right now, the summer season is about to end and we have to make frequent stops on our way in order to let the shepherds pass with their cows and horses as they take them down for the winter time. Look how many of them! Look at all these horses! So gorgeous! Pack horses! I've never had a chance to say pack horses, and here it finally is! You can see all the bags they're carrying, all the tents, clothes, here's a jacket. That's how people are leaving their villages up in the mountains for the winter, because staying for the winter up there with livestock is impossible. Only two or three people stay behind in each village, while all the others are taking all the livestock and lots of their stuff down into the valley where they will spend the winter. It all looks very impressive. This is one of the shepherds. He's been on the road for three days now. As you can guess, there are no hotels on this road. He sleeps on the ground, and when he arrives with his cows downhill, he'll have to go up again to drive his sheep down. The trip takes so much time that it's not an unusual thing for the livestock to produce new babies on the way. Here, look, they've got a baby calf tied up to a horse's saddle. How's the road? Uh, it'll do, I guess. Is it hard? Of course it is. Cows hurt their hooves a lot. None fell off? Well, one did. A cow fell off the cliff? Yes, two cows. Two cows fell off? Every shepherd has a burqa with him, a very thick and warm tent-like coat. 
it's crucial for survival, because while days in October are pretty warm, the nights, night temperatures can fall down to minus 12 degrees Celsius, that's 10 degrees Fahrenheit, even in August. Check this out. I've never seen anything like this. For everyone who's traveling this road, there is an overnight camping kit left on the roadside. It's there for everyone's use. Absolutely any person in need to spend the night here can use it. And take a look at all the stuff available here. They've got all sorts of pots and water. Water, mind you, and pans and buckets for cooking and washing whatever you need. And there's so much more. On top of that, they've got a solar panel. I mean, a real solar panel for communal use. That's impressive. There is a bulb so you can get some electric light at night. They've got mugs here. I can see someone drank coffee recently. There's some jar that can be useful, I guess. A pair of pliers, you know, in case someone needs pliers on the road. Let's see what else they've got here. The most important item in this kit is this big thing. It's a burqa, a sleeveless, buttonless cloak that is basically like a big woolen blanket you wrap around you. And see how much care they took to wrap it in plastic to make sure it stays dry for any traveler who might need it? I mean, it's amazing. It makes me think it's not so bad being a shepherd. I really admire how people take care of each other here because that's something you don't often come across in life. I'm so impressed. I want to express my fullest respect to all shepherds. This is a truly amazing place. Everything here is simple and clear. Are there any wild animals around? Yes. What kind? There are bears. For real? Wild goats? Aren't bears dangerous? No, they aren't. They don't disturb people, ever? No, they usually attack sheep and cows, so we take them down for winter. Shota is, in essence, the only person who lives by the road all the time. He is a roadmaster. He is the person people report any rock falls or other incidents to. You might wonder how he gets these reports. The answer is in person. To report an incident, you need to run, walk, or drive to his place here. He would be happy to take phone calls, but cell service is very weak in the mountains, and Shota's house is located in the place that gets no reception. This is the only place by the road with human presence. Two small houses, an unused power line support tower, all rusty. It used to support a power line back in the Soviet times, but it is no longer operational. And here, look, again, there's one more grave marker marking a site where someone died. They are everywhere on this road. Being a mountain roadmaster is, without exaggeration, among the riskiest jobs in the world. Every shift could be your last one. Shota recalls all his workmates who died. A six-wheeled Kamaz truck with our guys among them, two tractor drivers and one manager fell off the road. Here, three guys died. One survived. It happened right here. They were his friends. Now the place where the truck fell is marked with a stone. Shota's working hours are 24-7. He is here day and night. His shifts are very long, but eventually someone else takes over and he can have a break. Shota's co-worker will watch the road until Shota comes back. The houses are fully equipped for work and free time, and this view they have is quite literally to die for. So this is how they live here. Look, look here. They have a patio, a lovely romantic space with an amazing view. Here they've got a tap-up hand sink so you can wash your hands while enjoying this stunning mountain view. And it's so refreshing. And look at this view. Imagine waking up every day to this view right at your office. So you're like, wow, what an amazing job I have. And they've got everything they could possibly need here. A table for meals, lots of pans and pots for cooking, and everything, whatever you need. As for electricity, there's barely enough to charge a simple button cell phone. There's not enough to power a TV set, and just enough to power a light bulb. But they have gas, and that's how they make coffee and heat up food when they eat outside. <laughs> By the way, 
It's pretty cozy inside these houses. These are the living quarters. They've got a wood stove and look at all these beds. That's a lot of beds. You might wonder, why so many? The answer is simple. Men work here in shifts, one at a time, and everyone has his own bed. That's their personal space, and they like it this way. Here, along the walls, there are hooks to hang stuff on. Everyone gets some hooks for their personal belongings. What else have they got? They've got electric wires, I can see some bulbs under the ceiling. They've got a battery on the floor, and they connect wires to whatever they want to power, like to charge a button phone that doesn't need much power, and other things. Now, look at this beauty. Isn't this just gorgeous? Here, they've got a table. You can take a seat and listen to this radio. It's exactly like my grandpa used to have in his kitchen in Soviet times. So you sit here, enjoy this stunning view, and hope nothing bad happens. Guys, if you like my video and if you like what we are doing, I would really appreciate if you support us on Patreon, on Pioneer or on PayPal and we try to make even more great films from new dangerous places for you. Thank you. All the links are in the description. Please donate. Sometimes vans break down in places dozens of miles away from any life with no reception. For example, Gia here has been waiting for help for three full days. He is the guy whose gas truck broke down on the road, on this road, and not everyone can make it there. I mentioned him at the beginning of my report. Well, I've been riding this road for 32 years, and so I've never had anything like this. This is Gia. He's a local. He was driving his truck down and his engine suddenly stopped working. He spent three days here waiting for help. Three days and three nights. So, you understand. It must be cold here at night. How did you manage? It's very cold at night. I was freezing every night. Well, there are some people I know around here. They invited me to stay over and brought me food here so I could hold on. So Gia could have walked back to his village or stay the night at his friend's house, who live relatively close. But he couldn't just leave this spot, not because of his truck. You see, he's been sleeping here. He has no food or water. There are some people who brought him some food and even said, come, we've got a bed for you. But he said, no, I can't. I've got valuable cargo. And do you know what he has? Sheep. A truck full of sheep. Here's one looking at me. Uh-huh. So he was like, I can't leave them. Somebody will steal them. Another interesting thing to mention, our driver, Gotcha, has never known or met Gia until today. The spare parts he's brought him were also provided by people who don't know Gia. This readiness to give a helping hand in need is part of the national character with all Georgians. As we go, we begin seeing some houses in the distance. They seem to be elevated, and a closer look reveals they are built on tall stilts. While everything here seems so wild and pristine, there are still some villages in these mountains, and that's where we're headed. So after 12 hours on the road, we reached our destination. We are now 2,000 meters or 6,500 feet above sea level in a place really close to the Russian-Georgian border. This way is Dagestan, across the Tusheti Ridge. And that way is Chechnya, across the Atsunta Pass. We have finally reached the village 
of Omalo. See those old towers on top? They've been here for centuries. Most of the houses, or maybe all of them, are also made out of rocks using the same technique. And people still live in them. We have arrived just one week before the winter season starts. So there are very few people up here, five or six people at most. Only two or three of them will stay for the winter. Today, we will try to talk to all the locals who are still around and ask them how they live up here and what their life is like in wintertime. This is probably the most unusual village I've ever seen. It has a sort of main square and narrow winding streets leading away from it in all directions. The houses are built on stilts. That makes them safer because soil and rocks on the mountain slopes tend to slide down and any landslide can take a house with it. But naturally, they don't have any bricks up here, but the rocks are abundant. And that's what people have always used here for building. So, as you can see here, this is an old house built out of flat pieces of rock. And the amazing thing is that they didn't even use any kind of mortar. The rocks have been laid one on top of another, and that's it. Nothing else. I can even come and try to remove a piece out of the wall, like this piece, for example. I simply took it out. I will put it back, of course. But the thing is that the resulting walls are very sturdy and strong because all these rocks are really heavy. And when they're all piled on top of each other, the sheer weight of them makes these walls very strong. And no one will be able to knock them down. Walls made this way can bear significant load. They are as strong as the foundation used for building houses in other places. So people here are not afraid to build tall houses, up to four stories high. Here is one house under construction. The workers are trying hard to finish by the end of the summer season. Look how they deliver construction materials to the wall. They have put up scaffolding above the second floor. The back wall of the house will be covered by the mountain, and the opposite side will offer a fantastic mountain view. This is a shot of a house in another village in Tusheti. Now, I want you to pay attention to how you actually enter the houses in this place. For example, let's say I want to visit these people. The house is on a cliff, and the only way to get to it is to walk this rope bridge. And, you know, I don't really like the idea just looking at it, because these wooden planks are very old. However, as I said, I want to go there, so I'm going to try and walk this pretty scary bridge. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, I get on the bridge and I can feel it responding to my weight. The only thing that keeps me safe on it is... Wow, wow, I can feel these planks cracking under me and I don't like it. <sighs> Do you know the part that I hate the most about it? Not only it moves side to side as I walk, it's got a hole in it! I'm on solid ground. Oh, now, you know what to do if you wish to keep your guests away. I'm kidding, of course. Oh well, let's go. This village looks like a real movie set, with the authentic centuries-old towers. They could be the quarters of a local lord, and neat and tidy houses of the common folk around it. Cows and horses walk around freely, but other than that, this place has pretty modern infrastructure. They've got cafes that mainly serve tourists, and they look the same as the ones in Tbilisi. Oh, look at this police station. And just a few steps away, a shepherd is watching his sheep. We are now due to see the only doctor in this village. I'm still getting very distinct medieval vibes here, mostly because of these towers. 
They were built centuries ago for protection and defense. If anyone were to attack the village, the population moved inside the towers and defended themselves from there. Today, right next to the towers, is a residence of the local doctor, who serves a number of nearby villages. He even stays here for the winter and visits his patients on skis. Imagine that! This doctor is a local legend. It's next to impossible to find him at home. He's always somewhere making his way from one village to another to help those locals who need him. I can see his transport is parked, so he must be home, I guess. Looks like it. What does it say? Don't leave the door open. But the doctor wasn't home. He left a note, don't leave the door open. That says something about what it's like to get a doctor appointment in these mountains. He is not picking up his phone. Does he live alone? Is there anyone we could ask? No, there's no one. He stays here alone. So, where could he be? Could anyone know? Maybe someone got sick. None of the doors are locked in the house, so you can't really guess whether the owner simply stepped out a few minutes ago or has been gone for a whole week. And what if he, God forbid, fell off a cliff or got unwell himself? There's no one to look after him because all the people are gone by now. But he did come back the next day. Hello, how are you? All is good? I'm fine, thanks. We've been looking for you for some time, wondering if all is okay? And here he is, the legendary doctor, Irakli. He looks like indeed he had been called in on a case. He's wearing a medic vest and carrying a small bag. The guy is 82, and he walks faster than me. Irakli invites us home. The house is big, but he only uses one room during the winter keeping it warm. He's got a stove there and two beds. One is a spare for visitors. In another room, I see some photographs and prints of saints. Irakli lives here alone because he can't imagine his life anywhere but here. He is a neurologist by diploma, but that doesn't matter here. He helps all kinds of patients here. And whenever he helps anyone get well, he always says, it wasn't me, it's me and my friend. I've got an amazing friend and partner here. It's my horse, and I love him very much. My horse helps me with hard work around the house and helps me in my work. It takes me to those people who need my help. He is my real, true friend. Some 70 years ago, local people never even traveled outside of this village because there was no road. They didn't need it. It was really hard to become a doctor, that's true. I kept trying to get into a medical school for seven years in a row. Imagine the level of commitment. The guy took entrance exams seven years in a row. He began working in a city once he graduated, but then came back home to Amalo. He has been here for some 50 years ever since. He has long since lost count of all the people he has helped get better, hundreds and hundreds. But he does remember every complicated case like it was yesterday. Yeah, I've got some gauze pads and injection syringes. I always keep them in my bag after one case. Four years ago, a local young guy got drunk and started firing a gun. One bullet bounced off a wall and hit him. So, basically, he shot himself. It was through and through, from his belly to his buttock. It was a very grave case. That's when I needed a lot of gauze pads. Oh. 
Irakli is the only doctor they've got here for miles and miles around. This is why he's almost never home. In winter, he skis and has designed and made a very special kind of skis himself. I honestly believe this is absolutely ingenious. Ignore the way it looks and don't think Irakli didn't try normal skis. He did. People sent him proper branded skis, but they are of no use in these mountains because the snow here is both thick and fluffy. The kind of snow you want for free ride snowboarding. And so, after a while, Irakli figured out that he needs a couple of wide wooden planks. And he made the ski bindings for them too. And then, I think this part is a real innovation that might actually warrant some real recognition. See these green bits? They are plastic, and they are probably cut out of some tubes. And he fitted them onto the front part and inserted a piece of wood to reinforce the curve. And the point is that this way, these skis easily cut through the soft, fluffy snow that simply rolls off these green bits. Imagine that. The guy made it himself. And now, check this out. It's even more amazing. The ski poles of his own design. He took some sticks and attached empty plastic bottles to the ends with tape. And you know what I think? Even though it might look to many a bit too DIY, I believe it deserves a great deal of respect. This man is so committed to his neighborhood that he is ready to go to lengths to be able to cross these mountains so he could visit his patients in winter. And now we'll take a look at where doctors like Irakli work. He is taking us to the local medical station. A lot of things, including the new equipment, are still unpacked and wrapped in plastic. We get tourists here, and there were visitors from Japan who donated all of this to our village. Nino works as a nurse here, and she is among those few people who stay through the winter here. I used to be a nurse in a village down in the valley, but the salary was small. And I was told that if I move to the mountains, I'll have a permanent job and a bigger salary. So I moved here with my family. Nino gives us a tour of her house. This used to be a kindergarten, but it has no heating. And so Nino and her family move to live in the medical station building every winter. Nino's husband works here as a shepherd, and they have a daughter, Mariam, who has a medical condition. We realized there was something wrong with her when she was nine months old. We took her to doctors. They prescribed a treatment, but she only got worse. She was diagnosed with epilepsy. She has seizures sometimes. I give her meds every day. She can't live without them. Mariam is 15. She can't read and needs constant supervision. Simple things like making a simple meal or washing her clothes are a huge challenge for her. But she keeps trying. She needs someone to look after her at all times. Two years ago, doctors said she needs to stop taking meds. And then she had a terrible seizure. She fell, her body became stiff, and she started shaking all over. She even turned blue. It was awful. Mariam is a sweet girl, and she wants to help her mom. As you can see, she brings wood, tries to clean up the garden. She's 15. That's when her peers are hanging out, falling in love for the first time, learning things about life and starting to make plans. But Mariam spends a lot of time isolated. In summer, there are tourists who sometimes bring kids with them. But in winters, her mother is her only friend. I can't leave her alone. That's out of the question. During the winter, she cries a lot. She gets bored. There are no people around. Winter is the hardest time up here in the mountains. Living here in winter is very hard, but we don't have any other option. At first, Mariam stayed away from us while we talked to Nino. It was clear that she was curious, you know, new people with a camera arrived, but she was scared too. She doesn't know how to build relationships. It took her an hour to get closer to us. It took more time for her to start talking. But once she got comfortable, it was clear she's a wonderful girl, like all kids her age. She likes watching videos on YouTube, and when the signal fails, she draws and paints. Look at her art. It's all about her life. A piece of watermelon, a summer treat, then a butterfly she saw once. And then winter comes. This is grass, and this is rain, and then little snowflakes. Mariam's meds are covered by the state support program. Nino tries to give her daughter a good life, but her salary isn't always enough. 
If you would like to help Nino and Mariam, you are welcome to make a donation. We are enclosing the details. Our team gave the girl a tablet. She's been wanting one of her own for a while so she could stop borrowing her mother's, who needs it for work. Tourism is the main source of income in this place. Nino also runs a small tourism-oriented business. She makes homemade beer. First, she dries malt. It looks very cool. Then she dries some bread. And she also needs dried apples. But something happened. The cow is eating them. Those apples were no good anymore, so Nino brought more. She put dried malt, bread and apples into a bag and began cooking the mix on the fire. She cooked hops separately on a gas stove. After a while, the hops were added to the mix and everything was cooked for two more hours. Well, my friends, I've never tried a beer from a big stew pod, but now is my chance. Let's take a look at the color. Mm. It looks kind of muddy, but on the other hand, any dark beer looks pretty much the same. It doesn't really look like beer, though. Nope, it smells more like something, uh, you know, something herbal, I'd say, maybe with bark. And there are some bits, and it smells of earth too, like it's in there. Okay, let's give it a try. <laughs> not bad, not bad at all, I say. It's good. But it tastes more like a fruity drink made of dried apricots, you know? Because it's really sweet. But at the same time, I do taste behind all this sweetness some real hooch. So basically, it's a very sweet variety of beer. Like, if you recall, they had butterbeer in the Harry Potter books and movies. They went to Hogsmeade to drink it. Well, that's it. Mm. And since it's very warm, almost hot, I feel like I'm drinking an unusual kind of coffee or tea. I say it's fun. In summer, local hotels buy this beer really, well, to offer to tourists. There are thousands of visitors here every summer. However, in winter, when the road is closed, the only connection to the outer world is by helicopter. That's how they bring food up here. Fati came to live in Omalo in the late 1970s, when the village was full of people. She got married here. Then she founded a local museum and started her own business. Back in the day, people had big families. All had full families. There were a lot more people here than now, and you had prospects living here. My husband is from a nearby village too. His village was not far from here, and they had a lot of people there too, and everywhere in Tusheti in general. It's sad that it's no longer like this these days. Can you imagine running a business in a place that has no stores? Absolutely anything you might need has to be brought in via the same road we took. Every single brick, every sheet of metal. Just think of all the trips you'd have to take to bring food up here for all the tourists. Our visitors from Germany and Czech Republic helped us with electricity, and it's a huge help, but only in summer. Right now and during winter, we have to use wood. Men cut trees in the forest, and bring them here. But that's not the end of it. You have to split wood to make firewood. Just look at this axe. It is a marvel to behold, isn't it? Take a really good look at it. It reminds me of those wild folk in Game of Thrones that were called the Thens, if you recall. They had those scars all over their heads and faces. And they used axes like this one. <sighs> isn't it gorgeous? It makes me think of Vikings too. And people use axes like this even today in this place. It's not a museum artifact, it's a tool they use daily to split wood. I'll try to split some wood with it now. Although I'm checking it out and I must say it's not sharp. Although on the other hand, you don't need it sharp to split wood. I'll give it a try. It's actually very heavy and that's just what you need. Heavy is a good thing. Uh, 
And here we go, perfect, the axe is doing its job. I guess I got used to everything around here after all these years. I love people and all the people that come to stay with us are very good people. All the people I met around here are good people. You know, it's such a big inspiration in my job. It really helps me go on and run my business despite all the difficulties we have here. <laughs> Fatih is getting ready to close her hotel for the winter time. She will leave the village and spend the winter in the valley, only to come back in summer to open her doors for visitors again. She'll be back to more work and more of these amazing views. <laughs> The temperature can fall down to minus 50 degrees Celsius. That's minus 58 degrees Fahrenheit. And they get winds here, snow, avalanches, and the road is closed, and just a handful of people stay here till the spring comes. They really remind me of the Night Watch in Game of Thrones, the guys who kept watch on the wall in the north. And Dr. Arachle is like the local Jon Snow. It is his watch here every winter, and he won't give it up for anything. I once had a co-worker, a younger guy, another doctor, and he wanted my job for himself, as it turned out, and I was forced to quit. I got very depressed about it, because despite my age, I feel very well, I feel strong, and I know that people need me. They need my skills, my hands, my patients need me. After a while, they offered me to come back part-time, Despite my age, I don't care if it's a snowstorm or anything else. I've got my horse, I've got my spirit, and I am ready. And Irakli really does everything to be able to keep doing it as long as possible. He also tends to his horse and runs the household. And all his trips around the mountains are serious workouts. I get up at 6 a.m. every day and do morning exercises whenever I can, depending on the circumstances, like where I am. I do yoga, too. I also believe that labor is extremely important. You have to work, 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 and work. You must keep busy, and that will give you strength and energy to live and do more work. I am grateful to God for all my patients who lived. I am just a middleman between God and my patients, helping them not to meet their maker before their time. I'm not expecting any words of gratitude or any money whatsoever. The most important thing for a doctor is to see that the person is truly grateful for your help. That they realize you've helped them, and that they accept your help and are grateful for it in their hearts. As you're watching this report, Tusheti is already covered with snow and the road is closed for traffic. Very few people have stayed up in the mountains and the good doctor is most likely skiing around the neighborhood, making his way through all the snow on his self-made skis. Nino and Mariam have moved to the medical station and Fatih has moved down to the valley. Honestly, my four days in Tusheti have been four days of endless inspiration. I got a boost of energy like I've never felt before. And it comes not only from the mountains and the amazing nature around me, but from the people here. Because I think they are the real treasure here. These people are true Highlanders, as we call them. They are wise and strong, and they are loyal. They don't look for a better place elsewhere, as many of us do, let's be honest. They stay loyal to themselves, to their homes, to their homeland. And if you think of it, it is only thanks to them that we still have places like Omalo to travel to, because only their commitment and effort 
keep these tiny islands of civilization alive in a vast wilderness up here in the mountains. And I am forever grateful for that because it is my job to travel to such places and talk to the local people because that's what inspires me and fills me with endless admiration for them. <laughs>